So I've put together a presentation which is on understanding and managing emotions during the pandemic. Um, part of the reason I put this together, and it was about, I think, a week ago that I suggested it, is that I'm really aware, not just through the work that I do, but also um, based on people I've spoken to and responses on social media, that there's been a real change in the general feeling. Um, there's definitely this real sense of lowered morale. Um, there's a much heavier feeling now than there was in the first lockdown. Um, and I think there are a lot of contrasts, you know, in the way that people are discussing um, how we're managing it. And I think back to the first lockdown and, and perhaps some of the differences were we thought it was going to be short term. Um, we didn't know how long it was going to last. The sun was shining. We hadn't been through months and months and months of this. And I think there is something about the longer term impact that's certainly taking its toll. Um, and I've been thinking, building up to presenting this evening, that I'm feeling quite anxious and I was thinking about why. And I think it's partly because I haven't, I haven't run this presentation before. This isn't something that I've done in this way previously. But also because I think there's, there's part of being a psychologist, certainly, where you want to be able to fix things, you want to be able to make things better. Um, and I've really been struggling to provide any kind of magic solution or a way of making people better. And, and I think that's the difficulty with it, is that I was thinking, you know, want to be able to put something together where people go away and say, wow, that really helps. And I think the difficulty at the moment is we don't have a magic solution. So I think it's really, really important for me to perhaps manage expectations around that. Now, currently, we're, as you know, we're in, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And I think what's so challenging about that is that we haven't been through this before. Lots of people are making similarities with other events such as World War II and other situations resulting in, you know, extreme loss and complex grief reactions. But we've never really lived through something quite like this before. And what that means is that we don't have a familiar narrative. And that's really significant because things that we, we can work through, things that we can make sense of, usually we have, we have a narrative for them. We have a way of talking about them, making sense of them. Um, and in psychology, other traumatic experiences often that people go through regularly, we've done research into them, we've looked into how they impact on people longer term, um, and we don't know enough about this virus, we don't know enough about how it impacts on people physically, we don't know enough about how it impacts on people psychologically, and we don't know how the way in which we had to react to the pandemic is going to impact on people longer term. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that we're all finding our way through this, um, people generally and therapists alike, and that's partly what makes it so challenging and so difficult. So we're faced with this virus, we're faced with this virus which we don't understand, we don't know enough about. It's quite alien, it's quite alarming, it's quite overwhelming. And we're saturated with images, and I think it's really important to be mindful of this. Even for those of you who are avoiding the news and trying to stay away from these images in the newspapers or staying off social media, it's all there, isn't it? It's all over the place. You know, if we want to connect to people, if we want to connect in any way, then actually what there is, is a saturation of all these different images and ideas and discussions that are around the virus is everywhere. Um, you know, lots of things to do with statistics, the death rates, the total cases, it's all there. Every time you turn on the radio, every time you look at anything online, um, there's lots and lots of this information. A lot of information about social distances, daily number of cases, the healthcare system capacity. And all of that is really quite frightening. People's in, people in masks. And, you know, I think we've probably got to the point where we've got used to that. And, you know, I often think about the children and how, you know, how it doesn't seem that big a deal anymore. But actually, initially, there's something quite shocking and quite overwhelming, even about seeing lots of people wearing masks. We're seeing images of empty streets, which are quite unusual. Um, if any of you have been into central London during lockdown, there's something quite eerie, something quite strange about the whole, the whole feeling of that. We've got situations where there have been food shortages or certainly people stockpiling and empty shelves, you know, much more so last year. But that in itself is overwhelming. Queues for the supermarket and seeing lots of images of the NHS, you know, being overwhelmed, new hospitals and lots of different things to do with that um, and certainly last year as well lots of information about you know deaths in other countries 
And I think what, what really comes to me when I think about these things is that, you know, we're given this message, you just have to stay at home. And I, I remember thinking about this last year, this idea that you just have to stay at home. So that's not a big deal. You just have to stay at home. But actually, it's incredibly difficult because a lot of people are staying at home and we're still bombarded with the threat and the trauma of the virus. And it is threatening and it is traumatic because the impact on our physical and our mental health is threatening in lots of different ways. It is a threat to our physical health. There is a risk of illness. There is a risk of death. Um, and it's actually really traumatic. So even if we're sitting at home on our sofas, there's still all of this going on around, which I think is very, very difficult to escape from. So think about yourselves in the middle of all these images, completely saturated, overwhelmed by all the different things going on around you. It's understandable that this would feel a lot, this would feel overwhelming. And I think the other thing that really, really strikes me, and this is what I'm, I'm hearing a lot from people I'm working with, is that it's really hard to connect with other people because everybody is saturated with all of this. You know, everybody you speak to is struggling in some way with the impact of all of this. We're all feeling quite overwhelmed and unsure about what to do. It's threatening and it's traumatic. And I think it's really, really important to validate that, to acknowledge that, to make sense of that. And also to think about what happens in our brains when we're faced with threat and trauma. So what we understand about threat and trauma is that there's a part of our brain called the amygdala, which is like our brain's alarm system. And what happens when we're faced with threat and trauma is this part of the brain becomes activated and we don't process information in quite the same way as we would do ordinarily. It's our threat system and often it's referred to as having a fight, flight, freeze response. So it's important to be aware that when we're bombarded with all of this information, it's possible that this amygdala is kicking in and is saying, you know, you're in danger. This is a really threatening time to be living in. This is a really threatening situation. You might be on your sofa, but all of this is going on around you. This is overwhelming. This is difficult. And what's the impact of that? The impact of that is you tend to have this reaction, a reaction as you would do if you were not staying at home, if you were outside and you were faced with threat in a different environment, a different circumstance. And we talk about hyper arousal, and this is this heightened threat response. This is this feeling overwhelmed and what you might experience is your heart's racing. You might find that your breathing speeds up. You might find that it's difficult to concentrate. Your mind's racing, you're shaking, you're sweating. And there might be different degrees of that, but the trauma and the ongoing impact of being in a traumatic situation can keep you fixed in this state of hyper arousal. Um, often we talk about having surges of adrenaline, you know, feeling completely overwhelmed. And it's hard for your body to sustain that level of trauma. And then what you tend to find is you crash. So often you're in a situation where you're in this very, very heightened state and then you shut down. Um, and a lot of the time I'm, I'm speaking to people who are saying, I just feel exhausted all the time. I can't focus on my work. Um, I certainly can't focus on homeschooling my children. I'm really struggling. I'm waking up and I'm feeling tired. And this is part of the explanation is that often when you're bombarded with things that you find threatening, you feel overwhelmed and then your body kind of shuts down, goes to the other extreme. And this can happen over and over, over a period of time. And it can often feel like a roller coaster. So, you know, in working with people who experience trauma, they often say it feels like this, that they go up and down on a regular basis. Um, and when I do teaching sessions with people, sometimes I say to them, where are you on the hyper and hyper arousal scale? And it tends to fluctuate depending on the day, depending on a particular time of the day, depending on what your experiences have been, what's gone on earlier that day and how you've managed it. So if you're feeling those fluctuations in how you're feeling day in, day out, that is part of the explanation why. It's overwhelming and it's exhausting. And the other thing that, that really um, comes to mind when I think about trauma is that ordinarily when we're helping people through trauma, often what we're doing is we're helping people reduce that threat, bring that threat level down and increase resilience, increase the things that make you feel better, that might bring those threat levels down, that might make you feel more supported, better about yourselves and your lives. And I suppose the thing that I'm really aware of is that a lot of these things involve 
pleasurable events such as sporting events, it could be going to a music gig, it could be going on holiday, it could be spending time with other people, it could be physical contact with friends and family, it could just be sitting in a, in a cafe having a cup of coffee. Um, and gradually all of these things as we go into lockdown are taken away. And that makes it incredibly difficult when you're feeling traumatized to build up that level of resilience. Not to say it's impossible, I don't want to give a very bleak message here, but it makes it a lot harder because you don't have all of those things available. And I'm certainly noticing the difficulty in therapy with people that we don't have the same resources available to help them with the resilience side of it. Because we're in lockdown, and this is the third one. Um, and what it does in many ways is it isolates people and what we know about helping people psychologically a lot has to do with connection and pleasurable events and you know doing things that help you feel better on a day-to-day -day basis and it's very very difficult to do that when you're very isolated from other people and the things that you would have enjoyed previously so it's important to be aware that you've got fewer opportunities to build resilience and a greater exposure to trauma. The other thing I want to acknowledge, and I'm not going to go into lots of detail about this, but as I said, if this is something that people are struggling with and they want to talk about it, then do get in contact. But just to acknowledge the fact that not only are we in a situation where we're living through a global pandemic and surrounded by a lot of threat associated with that, it has intensified a lot of the pre-existing problems that people have. So if people are living in a situation where they have difficult family relationships, whether there's domestic violence, whether there's childhood abuse, these rates we know are going up because it's a very pressured situation. And if everybody in a household is feeling stressed and traumatized and overwhelmed and exhausted, then the tensions go up. Um, so we're seeing lots and lots of um, increases in referrals for a lot of different associated difficulties. And this is something that really struck me in the, in the last lockdown. I was thinking, you know, I had days, and I don't know whether other people identify with this, days where there, there were ways I wanted to be, you know, and I thought about ways in which we could manage it and we could get through it together. And some of this came out at times. You know, this idea of having this kind of blitz spirit, this idea of coming together, and certainly that was more apparent in the first lockdown. You know, the rainbows in the windows and the clapping for the NHS and coming together. Um, at times, and this is only relevant for those of you who have seen the film, but I think about um, Jojo Rabbit and Scarlett Hansen, who's, you know, helping her son through the, the trauma of the Second World War and how she's, she's in colourful clothes and she's trying to bring a lot of fun and light into the experience, even though there was all this trauma going on outside. And there were times I was thinking, I want to be more like her, I want to be more like her. And the other person that comes to mind, although I don't know whether you want to aspire to be him <laughs> quite as much, but Clive Owen, and I think in, in, in Children of Men, because there's something about that film where a lot of that feels very reminiscent of now. And there was something about him in that film where he's, you know, eventually becomes the hero who, you know, ends up navigating through all these difficult experiences. So there might be times where you kind of think, right, I want to have this strength and I want to be able to channel this energy and, and, and be able to react in a certain way. But sometimes it's just not possible because actually we're feeling overwhelmed. We might be anxious, we might be exhausted, we might be feeling lonely. We might be grieving for people that we've lost, um, might be feeling confused in shock and just really struggling to understand what's wrong. Um, so I think one of the key messages, and maybe this sounds really, really simple, um, but I think it's important. And the reason I've put all of that in at the beginning is it's important to say to yourselves, it's understandable you feel the way you do. And that is a really, really key part of how it's important to respond to how you're feeling. Because if you think about it, we are going through a collective trauma through this pandemic and loss in loads of different areas of our lives. You know, we're staying at home, we're losing so much of the social contact and activity that we would have had before. We're not able to go on holiday, we're not able to do the things that we would have enjoyed previously. There's a lot more social isolation. The schools are closed, which means that our children are missing out on really big chunks of their education. Some children last year missed their last, you know, days and weeks in school, missed important exams. Um, children missed their, you know, time in reception. Lots of different things which equate to loss um, and trauma. 
Lots of people are really struggling with employment, losing their jobs, really struggling to manage the demands of their jobs um, with everything else, with having children at home or the financial consequences of that. And we're seeing a lot of shops closing down. And, you know, there are a lot of, you know, different places that have become part of our memories of, of the British high streets that are closing down. And I know a lot of people have had discussions recently about the big top shop in Oxford Street and how it was almost like a really key part of that area of London. And there's something quite overwhelming about the thought of these places closing down. Um, it's all loss. And loss tends to result in feelings of grief and, and sadness. That's a really normal response to, to those kind of experiences. And, you know, for any of you who have seen the information sheet I put together, I put in this Kubler-Ross grief cycle. And I like this just because what it acknowledges is similar to the roller coaster, that it's understandable and it's normal for you to go up and down, you know, through the process of grieving with lots of these different emotions, you know, that could be around denial, confusion, anger, frustration, depression, helplessness, often you go through and you go up and down into lots of different emotions. So the important part is thinking, well, how can I build resilience? What is it that I can do to actually help in this situation? And acknowledging that actually a lot of the things we did previously are not available in the same way. We can't do exactly what we wanted to do as we did previously. So we need to think around that and we need to think what is available and what we can do in the current circumstances. So when I started reading about psychological responses to, to COVID, and I've done quite a lot of reading over the last week, and a lot of the, the things that people are talking about are around acceptance and commitment. And the reason that's a really important model in the current circumstances is we have very little control over what happens. So I've drawn upon some of the some of the models and some of the literature that's out there that people have written in response to the pandemic. And one of the, one of the things I found is by somebody called Russ Harris, who does a lot of work around acceptance and commitment therapy. And I've put the reference at the end. And it's actually a really nice summary of some of the things that you can do to kind of try and manage your emotions. And he's put it um, into a list of different things, which I'm going to run through with you. So, and he's acknowledged to start off with that you can't control what happens in the future. You can't control coronavirus itself or the world economy or how your government manages this whole sordid mess. They're his words, not mine. And you can't magically control your feelings, eliminating all that perfectly natural fear and anxiety. But you can control what you do here and now, and that matters. And I think that that's a really key message because I think that a lot of us probably are feeling quite frustrated and overwhelmed. And it would be lovely if we had the resources to be able to offer more mental health support or to, you know, make decisions or influence decisions of the government to actually change the way things are done. But we are currently in a situation where we're all fairly helpless in terms of the wider situation and how it's being managed. So it's coming back and thinking, OK, what can I do to control how I feel and what I do in my life in the present moment? And a lot of people say to me, and I had somebody today who I work with, he said, but I feel like I'm drowning in it all. It's all too overwhelming. And absolutely get that. And I think that a lot of us have had moments where we feel similarly, like it's all too much. Now, one of the analogies that Russ Harris uses, and I really like this, is about being on a, on a boat in a storm on the sea. And he says, if you're in, on a boat in the, in the middle of the storm in the sea, then you can't navigate your way out of the storm in that moment. You know, it's, there's no point at that, at that moment in finding somewhere to go or trying to move. What you need to do is you need to drop your anchor and you kind of need to almost drop your anchor and see out the storm and come out of the other end. And in order to do that, there are three things that are important to do. And he talks about these three things are important to do regularly throughout the day, every day if you can, and cycle through them. And these are the three things that are important to do so that you can then think about acting and you can think about doing the second part of the things that he's recommended. So first of all, acknowledge how you're feeling, acknowledge the roller coaster, acknowledge that it's understandable that you're having all these emotions, that they're going up and down and they're perhaps all over the place in a way that's quite overwhelming. I'm anxious, exhausted, grieving, confused, 
name and acknowledge how you're feeling. Just fully allow yourself to recognize that, recognize that and accept it. And again, that might seem like a really straightforward thing, but I think we're pretty good in lots of different situations at telling ourselves that we shouldn't be feeling a certain way or we should be feeling better or we should be managing better. The first step, name and acknowledge how you're feeling. The second thing is, is come back into and connect with your physical body. Now this can be done in lots of different ways. And one of the, I suppose the quickest ways is to take a really, really deep breath. You know, we often talk about the breath being an anchor. And again, that might sound really simple, but a lot of us, when we're feeling stressed and overwhelmed without realizing it, we speed up, we walk quicker, we talk quicker, we do more. When actually what we need to do to de-escalate that threat level is actually slow down a bit. And one of the ways you can do that is you can slow down your breathing. You can take deep breaths. You can put your hand on your abdomen and you can take these very deep breaths and you can find ways to connect physically. The other way that you can do that is you can stretch in your chair. You can push your feet into the floor. Um, here, recommendation, you could go out barefoot, perhaps not in the winter, and you, know, you could feel the grass under your feet. Finding ways to connect with your physical body as a way of anchoring yourself. The other thing that's really helpful is, is grounding. Now, grounding can be being aware of what's going on in the present moment. So if you're finding yourself ruminating about things that have happened in the past, or you're feeling very anxious and overwhelmed about things happening in the future, bring yourself back to the present. And you can do that by having, say, a pebble in your pocket you're feeling the texture of, or smelling something that you like, or counting the number of books on the bookshelf, or just fully engaging in what you're doing at the time. So whether it's, you know, <laughs> whether it's washing up or whether it's having a shower and feeling water on your body, but coming back to the present moment and engaging more fully. Now, there's a, there's a book by uh, Bessel van der Kolk called The Body Keeps the Score. And anyone that's interested in learning a bit more about trauma, it's a really, really good overview of how the body is affected by trauma and how it stays with you. And he says about grounding, visiting the past in therapy should be done while people are, biologically speaking, firmly rooted in the present and feeling as calm, safe and grounded as possible. Grounded means that you can feel your butt in your chair, see the light coming through the window, feel the tension in your calves and hear the wind stirring in the tree outside. So something about fully engaging in the present. So what, what Russ Harris says is that dropping anchor is a very useful skill. You can use it for handling difficult thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, urges and sensations more effectively. You can switch off autopilot, engage in life, grounding and steadying yourself in difficult situations, disrupting rumination, obsessing and worrying, and focusing your attention on the task or activity you are doing. And what he says is the better you anchor yourself in the here and now, the more control you have over your actions, which makes it a lot easier to do the next steps. So this is the first bit. And then secondly, he talks about the next steps that you can go through. So the first one is around committed action. And the recommendation is that repeatedly throughout the day, you ask yourself, what can I do right now in this moment, no matter how small it may be, that improves life for myself or others I live with, or people in my community and whatever the answer is do it and engage in it fully and you know again that might seem like a simple thing but he talks a lot about committed action based on the kind of values and the things that are important to you now you may not be somebody who wants to go off and volunteer at a food bank so there's a picture of our food bank up there um, and there's also a picture of a, a banner we put together for the, the children's school to say thank you for the teachers Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be something on that scale. It could be going for a, a distance walk in the forest with a friend, or it could be taking yourself out of the house for exercise and reading a book somewhere just to calm down, just to feel a bit better. Um, but just really thinking, what can I do? And absolutely acknowledging that you're not able to do all the things you want to be doing. You know, you don't, you don't want to be sitting at home. You don't want to be limited to going for a walk in the woods you don't want to be not seeing your friends and having to deal with these, these things but at the moment we have no control over that so thinking okay what can I do no matter how small in the current and present moment 
And um, I was reading something today, which uh, was by David Lindo, who's the urban birder, and he's written um, an article in The Guardian, which says, amid the gloom of lockdown, I have taken solace in nature. And it's a nice article because it's really just talking about how grim it all was at the beginning. And I think he was in Spain at the start of the last lockdown. And he was just talking about birds and the birds that he'd watched in different places and how even the pigeons can be fascinating and how he's watching certain birds coming and going. And, you know, that may not be for you, but there probably is something that actually you are finding that you can engage with and get pleasure about, you know, get pleasure out of in the current situation. And important to focus on that, important to actually find things that bring you joy, that make you feel connected, that make you feel slightly better, even if it's just small steps here and there. The second bit is about opening up. Now, opening up means making room for difficult feelings and being kind to yourself. And I would say if there's a, a single take home message from all of this, it's about being kind to yourself. And this is incredibly important because we can't stop the emotions from arising. We are going to have days where we feel anxious, we can have days where we feel angry, where we shout at the children, where we shout at each other, where we feel dreadful, we don't wanna get up, we don't want to do any of those positive things. So acknowledging they're normal and allow them to be there even though they hurt, but also treating ourselves kindly. Now, one of the, you know, I've listened to lots of things on self-compassion and it's really, really hard. It's one of those things that everyone recommends and it's really hard to do. And there are all sorts of different things you can listen to. But I was listening to something by Kristin Neff, who's done a lot of research. And it was just something on YouTube, one of those videos. I don't know if it was a TED talk or, and she did this really nice exercise in the talk that she gave. And she said, what I want you to do is I want you to stop and I want you to really think about how you speak to other people and I want you to think about not only what you say to people who are struggling so if you've got a friend currently who's struggling with the pandemic who's perhaps got a lot of other trauma going on in their life perhaps they're struggling with relatives children homeschooling how are you speaking to them not just what are you saying to them but what tone of voice are you using when you're speaking to those people and just stop and think about that for a second and then I want you to think about what you're saying to yourself when you're having a difficult day, when you're struggling, when you're, um, you know, finding everything too much, when you haven't done enough work with the kids, you haven't been outside, you feel like you're not managing. How are you speaking to yourself? Are you speaking to yourself, saying the same things, using the same tone, or is there something different? And I can't, I can't speak for you and I'd be interested if people have got comments at the end, but a lot of the people I work with and a lot of the people I know will say, actually, when I'm speaking to myself, I'm really hard on myself. Um, I'm much more, you know, hard, I'm much more inclined to say, come on, what's wrong with you? Get on with it. You know, why can't you manage this? You should be able to do better. Whereas when I'm talking to somebody else, I'm much kinder, I'm softer, I'm more compassionate. And I think the really important question to ask is why? Because if you're going through a situation where you are struggling, you are feeling overwhelmed and traumatized, you are feeling exhausted, you are not managing, and you are shouting at yourself or berating yourself or criticizing yourself, that is a little bit like kicking somebody when they're already on the floor. Um, so I think it's really important to think about that. And again, I've put a resource to the Compassionate Mind Foundation in the references section and there's lots of really nice um, resources things that you can read different audio files you can listen to but even just doing a search on on youtube and listening to something by brenny brown or Kristen neff or paul gilbert or somebody like that there are a lot of good resources like that that can really help you with this because it's an ongoing struggle um, for everybody i believe so the next thing is to think about your values so the idea that committed action should be guided by your core values. So really stopping and thinking about, well, what do you want to stand for in the face of this crisis? Not what grand things you want to do, not, you know, have you, I don't know, written a novel or learned the mandolin or, or whatever else it is, but what sort of person do you want to be as you go through this? How do you want to treat yourself and other people? And 
of course, as this crisis unfolds, there will be sort of obstacles in your life, goals you can't achieve, things you can't do, problems for which there are no simple solution. But I think what's being acknowledged here is you can still live your values in, in lots of different ways, even in the face of those challenges. What can you say and do that will enable you to look back and feel proud of your response? And that might be something very small. So the lady I was working with today, she's had lots of physical health problems as a result of traumatic experiences last year. Her mother developed cancer. She's been struggling, struggling in lots of different ways. But for her, what's really important is to be there for other people, to be there for her friends and her family. That is part of her core value. She wants to be caring. She wants to be kind. No matter how much she's struggling, that's what's important. And for you, it might be something really different. But actually just thinking, what is it I want to be able to do in this current situation that will make me feel proud of how I reacted? The other thing that's really important is identifying resources. And there are loads out there. I find it very, very difficult to know where to look. So identify resources for health assistance, support and advice if you need it. This can include friends, family, neighbours, health professionals. It could include emergency services. I can't emphasize enough how important it is for you to connect with other people. And yes, it's very difficult. And no, it's not the way we want it to be. We're not able to meet people in the pub. We're not able to go out for dinner. We're not able to see people face to face. And I absolutely recognize that this is not the same. I mean, teaching in front of a screen is not the same. Therapy through a computer is definitely not the same. Seeing friends on a Zoom quiz is not the same as being out with them but we are limited. What is it you can do? How can you connect with people? Does it help a little bit if you sit and have a video chat or pick up the phone to somebody? And I think the importance of reaching out to social networks and if you're able to, to offer support to other people, you know, we are all going through this and it's about us finding ways to connect with each other. I think it's also really important to find reliable and trustworthy sources of information, such as the World Health Organization website, rather than being saturated with frightening and overwhelming news stories. There is a huge amount out there that's really overwhelming and frightening. The World Health Organization website has a lot of factual information about COVID. If you want to read about it, it's a good place to start. I think the other thing that's important is also being selective about social media. You know, it's very easy to get overwhelmed in looking at all these amazing, um, you know, homeschooling ideas or people who've painted murals on their houses or written novels or learnt an instrument, whatever else it is. But if you're engaging with that and it's making you feel bad, then stop engaging with it. You know, stop following people, get off, do something different, put your phone somewhere else. Um, I think it's really important to, to, to be really mindful of what it is you're engaging with and how you're feeling in response to that. Um, and then I've put in them what is actually probably quite sadly one of my favourite cartoons that makes me giggle every time I see it. If you're really struggling, then it's really important to go and get some kind of professional help if that's something you feel that you need. So in reference to being selective about what you read on social media and who you connect with, these are two things that in the last week um, really resonated with not only with me, but with also what I've, I've talked about today in this presentation. So the first one is, is written by Matt Haig, who's written The Midnight Library, which seems to be very popular currently, although I haven't read it. So he said, get a routine baggy enough to live in. Uncertainty breeds anxiety. Routines are the counterbalance. Limit news intake. We aren't designed for a 24-7 overload of doom that we have little control over. Ditch guilt, there is no right way to live through this. Just getting through is sometimes enough. Remember, you don't have to be productive in your downtime. You don't have to learn the mandolin or study Italian. Having a shower and eating toast and existing is just as legitimate. And I think that's a really key point, you know, recognizing we're living through a pandemic and actually getting up and just managing the day is really, really important. Reframe uncertainty. Uncertainty can have a positive effect. When we realise we can't predict the future, we can spend that energy in the present. So again, very much relating to what I've talked about in this presentation. Breathe. Breath is your mood barometer to know how you feel. Place your hand on your stomach and feel your breath and then slow it. A busy brain wants nothing less and needs nothing more than to slow down. Connect online properly. Don't just go on random like sprees. Converse, console, connect, then time out. Put your phone in another room for a while or walk the dog without it. Um, I can't tell you how many people have talked about how 
how positive it's been to have a dog and how it's been such a protective factor to actually have a dog and take it out and um, seems to be a really you know really popular thing currently um don't be a dick wear a mask don't spread conspiracies look after others support health workers caring feels good and remind us we're in that in this together appreciate the outside world nature is calming because it connects us with eternity the sky is always the sky a tree doesn't give a shit about the news we are nature we become ourselves within it and finally and i think this is incredibly important too remember that this one day will be over and we will appreciate the things we couldn't do more than ever before this is a massive value check we have learned what we really need and miss and what and who we can do without and very often the worst of times leads to the best of us Change is pain, but pain is growth. Like a night sky, we sometimes need the dark to see the light. So that's really talking about something about post-traumatic growth, about how you know, there will be something at the end of this where everybody has been forced to reevaluate you know, the importance of relationships, the importance of things that they do in their lives. And there's gonna be an adjustment, there's gonna be a change. And this other one is something, um, someone I don't follow, and one of my friends sent me this, which is, when I say I can't do this, and then I go and do it, it's not because I was being dramatic or doubting my ability or strength. It was because I knew I was spending something of myself that I didn't have to spare. And then we clap each other on the back and say, see, I knew you could do it. You're strong, you're brave, you've got this. When sometimes what we need most of all isn't to be clapped for what we've managed, but to have the cost acknowledged and to be supported in trying to save some of ourselves up for the next time. I really like that too. And I, I'm aware because I talk about a lot of these different things with people in therapy and people more generally. People are saying, I get all of this, but it's so hard to do. And I think I'm acknowledging that and I'm absolutely recognising that we've got to make adjustments. And those adjustments aren't easy. It is not easy having to sit on Zoom calls in order to connect with people that we want to see in person. It is not easy juggling the demands of work and homeschooling with children. There are so many different adjustments that we have to make currently that are really, really challenging and difficult. And acknowledging that to yourself often is a step towards actually being a bit kinder and helping yourself take things a bit easier. And I'm also recognizing that anchoring is difficult. It's something that needs to be practiced. It's something that needs to be worked on, especially because depression, depressive rumination can pull you back into the past and anxious thoughts can pull you into the future. So often it's really hard to stay in the present. So if you're somebody that's struggling with depression or anxious, catastrophic you know, thoughts about things that might happen in the future, then it's often incredibly difficult to anchor yourself. So regular practice, going over, doing it again in the same cycle is a really, really important part of it. The other thing that tends to happen and this is a model that's used very commonly in health anxiety, but also obsessive compulsive presentations, is there are a lot of different things that people do that actually feed back into their anxiety. That could be about preoccupation with the news, social media, but also hypervigilance to physical symptoms or checking for signs of illness or Googling particular symptoms. Just being aware that a lot of the time people do those things and sometimes it's important to stop those, to distract yourself to do something else otherwise you're actually feeding into the anxiety so we're recognizing that we can't control the situation but we can control what we focus on and what we do and the last thing that that Ross Harris talks about is the importance of disinfecting and distancing physically and I feel we've probably all been absolutely overwhelmed with that message you know over the last several months so just saying to yourself and recognizing it's understandable you feel the way you do but if you're really struggling to cope then do go and get some therapy um, i am aware that there are lots of difficulties currently in getting therapy on the nhs services are really um, oversubscribed but usually you can go to a gp and you can ask for a referral to mental health service if you want to seek something privately, then often the counselling directory is a good place to start because you can search by location, you can search by speciality, and you can look to see um, who's currently got availability. And also just going back to the, the bit about trauma and just saying there's a really complicated response that goes on in our brains in relation to trauma. And if you want to learn more about that, 
I have put a link to the resources page on our website so you can go and watch the video and make sense of that and just to recognize that you know if that is something that you're struggling with you are struggling with overwhelming traumatic memories that are coming back then again there is therapy that's available that can help you process and make sense of those um, memories and emotions so i've just finished here with some resources so some of the things i've talked about today and a couple of extra things so i hope some of those are helpful if there's anything else that you want then of course get in touch and you can ask okay